everyone, welcome to Legal Bites. I'm Alita and on this channel, we explain the law one bite at a time. Today we're doing another installment of Pop Culture Trials, this time with Jurassic Park. We're taking a literal bite out of the law. <laughs> Specifically, we'll take a look at how Dr. John Hammond, InGen, and the Hammond Foundation are probably liable for harms caused at Jurassic Park. Coming up on Legal Bites. Hold on to your butts. Okay, so unless you've been frozen in some chunk of amber for the last five billion years, you know that Jurassic Park is a film that is based off of a novel by Michael Crichton of the same name. The movie came out in 1993 and launched a massive franchise of movies and games for that matter, uh, which is expected to continue to at least 2021 with the movie Jurassic World Dominion. To start off, I love this movie. I have loved this movie for as long as I can remember. I mean, literally, this movie came out when I was very young and I grew up wanting to be Dr. Ellie Sattler. I wanted to be a paleontologist and I wanted to go around and dig up dinosaur bones and be an adventurer just like her. In fact, I was Dr. Ellie Sattler for Halloween at least twice as a kid and visited archaeological sites and digs whenever I could and got as involved as they would possibly let me. And if my mom has had any luck excavating the memorabilia of my childhood, then up on the screen should be a photo of me as a kid as Dr. Ellie Sattler or at one of those digs. Hello? Hi, Mama. Hi. Hi. Have you by any chance found any of those photos that we were talking about? No. Oh. So upon revisiting this movie for the umpteenth time recently, there's of course the theme that man should not be playing creation games because it'll end terribly. God creates dinosaurs. God destroys dinosaurs. God creates man. Man destroys God. Man creates dinosaurs. Dinosaurs eat man. Woman inherits the earth. And then there's the lesson that even if we try to control nature, life always finds a way. So the kind of control you're attempting is, uh, it's not possible. Listen, if there's one thing the history of evolution has taught us, it's that life will not be contained. Life breaks free, it expands to new territories, and it crashes through barriers painfully, maybe even dangerously, but, uh, well, there it is. There it is. You're implying that a group composed entirely of female animals will breed? No, I'm, I'm simply saying that life uh, finds a way. Well, I also remembered how there was pretty much liability everywhere in the movie, and I had to talk about it. Now, I'm setting aside the part where they talk about how they probably shouldn't have made the park in the first place, and I won't get into every single legal detail, but I will focus on Dr. John Hammond's and InGen's and the Hammond Foundation's negligence in causing harm through wrong, wrongful death, personal injury, and other emotional harms to the other characters in the storyline. All right, so just to give a bit of a roadmap, we'll start by summarizing the facts of the storyline, and then I'll give an analysis, and then I'll give a conclusion. And if you wanna skip ahead, I'll set up timestamps in the description below. And to be clear, this video is only about the first film in the franchise, so if you haven't seen any of the more recent ones, it won't be a spoiler for you. But just in case you haven't seen the first one, I'm going to give 10 seconds of Jeff Goldblum footage so that you can pause it and maybe revisit. Okay, Jeff Goldblum starting now. Jurassic Park is about an eccentric man's dream to fill a huge zoological park with exotic and dangerous animals and to bring people in from all over the world and make millions from visiting tours, merchandise, and thematic music. That crazy man is... I saw a tiger, now I understand. Oh, wait. Oh, no, 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 no. Sorry, I got my notes mixed up. <laughs> 
<laughs> Jurassic Park is about an eccentric and extremely wealthy man's dream to bring dinosaurs out of extinction and to clone them and fill an entire island with them so people can come from all over the world to go on dinosaur safaris. That crazy man is Dr. John Hammond. He is the founder of the Hammond Foundation, which leased the island off the coast of Costa Rica, and the founder and CEO of International Genetics Incorporated, more commonly called InGen. InGen does the science stuff to bring the dinosaurs back from extinction. It's kind of magical. But there's a problem. The investors of InGen are concerned about the dangers at Jurassic Park now that an employee has been killed by one of the dinosaurs. Because I mean, a park filled with man-eating animals. What can go wrong, right? About an hour ago, we had an incident where one of the employees stuck their arm through the cage and the tiger tore her arm off. So they send Donald Gennaro, a lawyer, to examine the place to determine if the safety of the park is good enough to warrant the investors' continued involvement. Mr. Gennaro brings with him Dr. Ian Malcolm, a mathematician slash chaotician, as an expert to examine the risk levels. Hello? Hello? Yes? I really hate that man. The investors also require Dr. Hammond to bring two other experts out of the field of paleontology. So Dr. Hammond pays Dr. Alan Grant and Dr. Ellie Sattler to come for a weekend to examine the park and hopefully give their seal of approval. Never mind the fact that Dr. Hammond maybe creates a conflict of interest by paying them a huge amount of money to get them to come out, and also the fact that he doesn't tell them at all what's in the park until they get there. Anyway, when they all get there, they see that the island is filled with real-life dinosaurs, and not just herbivores. They've created T-Rexes, Velociraptors, and the venom-spitting Dilophosaurus. After they learn about how they managed to create and clone the dinosaurs, they're joined by Dr. Hammond's grandchildren, Alexis, Lex Murphy, and Tim Murphy. Joined by the kids, Dr. Grant, Dr. Sattler, Dr. Malcolm, and Dr. Gennaro all go on what's supposed to be a fun and exciting dinosaur safari. When they're on it, they start to face problems with the overall park systems. Item 151 on today's glitch list. We have all the problems of a major theme park and a major zoo and the computers aren't even on their feet yet. They also start to face a tropical storm coming in, which can endanger everyone on the island. I'll keep an eye on it. Maybe it'll swing south like the last one. At the same time, unbeknownst to anyone else at InGen, one employee named Dennis Nidri has agreed to steal viable dinosaur embryos from InGen and to sell them to Biosyn, InGen's competitor, for a total of $1.5 million. Mr. Nidri, a computer programmer at Jurassic Park, steals the embryos and hides them in a can of shaving cream with a secret compartment. The bottom screws open. <laughs> it's crazy. Oh, you God. It's cool to compartmentalize inside. Oh, you got so that's great. Customs can even check it if they want to. Go on. To get access to the embryos and then a path to the Biosyn people, he initiates a backdoor that disables nearly all of Jurassic Park's security features. To cover his tracks, Mr. Nidri then alerts his supervisors that some of the security features might get disabled because he's performing maintenance on them, but that there isn't anything to really worry about. Mr. Nidri then goes on, but while on the road in the rain, he gets disoriented, crashes, and then foolishly gets eaten by a Dilophosaurus before he can get the embryos to the Biosyn people. At the same time, once Mr. Nidri initiates the back door, almost all of the dinosaurs are let loose out of their compartments and free to roam around Jurassic Park and terrorize the visitors on the dinosaur safari. Several employees and Mr. Gennaro get eaten by dinosaurs. In the end, Dr. Hammond, Dr. Grant, Dr. Sattler, Dr. Malcolm, Lex, and Tim manage to escape the island but not before they each sustain injuries, undoubtedly both physical and emotional. <laughs> Must go faster. Okay, on to the analysis. Hold on to your butts. Okay, so let's take stock. Donald Gennaro, the blood-sucking lawyer, is dead. <laughs> Lawyers, man. Lawyers, man, right? Dr. Grant, Dr. Sattler, Dr. Malcolm, Lex, and Tim have all survived, but not without physical injuries and very likely emotional harm that is probably going to show up in the coming weeks and months. Because of that, they each file a lawsuit against InGen, the Hammond Foundation, and Dr. Hammond. Except for Mr. Gennaro, of course, because him being dead, he can't file a lawsuit. In his case, his estate will file a lawsuit against all three defendants. So now I'll put on my plaintiff's hat to continue with the analysis. Because there's no one.
trying to talk me out of it. For a wrongful death in a personal injury matter like this one, you're going to be looking at two different possible theories of liability. The first one is strict liability. Strict liability is shown where the plaintiff is able to show that they were harmed and that the defendant is responsible for that harm. It's usually reserved for only specific types of cases, like the manufacturing of a defective product or the ownership of a dangerous animal. For an animal attack, an owner will be held strictly liable really only if the owner knows or has reason to know about the animal's dangerous propensities. For a dog bite, for example, there has to be some sort of previous evidence of the dog snapping or biting at or lunging at people. Exotic pets that are generally known to be dangerous to humans like bears, lions, tigers, usually don't need to show some prior behavior because it's generally understood that they are dangerous to humans. The same would be the case for dinosaurs. But even if for some reason strict liability isn't available to the plaintiff as a theory of liability, the plaintiff can also assert negligence. Negligence basically means that the defendant either did something that they weren't supposed to do or were supposed to do something and didn't do it, and that as a result, the plaintiff was harmed. In order to show negligence, a plaintiff has to prove four main elements. First, the plaintiff has to show that the defendant had a duty. Second, the plaintiff has to show that the defendant breached that duty. Third, the plaintiff has to show that he or she was harmed as a result of the breach. And finally, the plaintiff has to show that the plaintiff's harm was actually caused by the defendant's breach. In many states, the question whether the defendant has a duty can be determined by looking at whether the injuries sustained by the plaintiff can be reasonably foreseeable to result from the conduct in question. In this case, the defendants had a duty to prevent the visitors of the park from getting eaten, clawed at, or otherwise harmed by their attempts to escape the dinosaurs when they escaped from their padlocks. The defendants definitely breached their duty in several ways. First, there are insufficient signs warning the visitors about the dangers that are all around the park. Second, they failed to provide any kind of training for these visitors in the event that they might actually come in contact with one of these dinosaurs. They had no idea how they should be responding to these in order to try to evade some sort of an attack from them. And finally, and most importantly, they failed to provide sufficient security measures to prevent the visitors from coming in contact with the dinosaurs. This can be seen in the failure to place locks in the cars to prevent the visitors from leaving the safari tour. I told you how many times we needed locking mechanisms on the vehicle Stop doors. Right vehicle. This can also be seen in the single layer of physical barriers between visitors and dinosaurs. And to make matters worse, that single barrier relies exclusively on the presence of electricity on a tiny remote island off the coast of Costa Rica, which can and does become unavailable. And finally, they breached by placing all of the security and communication systems into one centralized system. Relatedly, they didn't have a backup system in place for the event that the system went down for maintenance purposes or for any kind of a glitch, for example. They should have had them broken down into multiple systems, and then they should have also had backups for those multiple systems so that they could do maintenance, or if there was some sort of an emergency on the island, they could still have power and not risk the lives of everyone on the island. And as for the harm to the plaintiffs, first you have Mr. Gennaro. <laughs> And then you have the rest of the plaintiffs. Although some injuries likely appeared after the events of the film, you can see that Dr. Malcolm, Dr. Sattler, Dr. Grant, Miss Murphy, and Mr. Murphy all suffered physical injuries to limbs as well as likely the spine, head, and soft tissue damage throughout the body as well. And then there's likely mental and emotional harm such as depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder that can show up in the following weeks or months after this whole ordeal has happened. And as for causation, it's pretty clear that if not for these breaches of duty, these harms likely wouldn't have happened. But there is more to analyze here. So I'll just take off my plaintiff's hat and put on my defense attorney hat. And let's take a look at a few more facts. There's nothing I can do. The captain said we gotta go. We gotta go. No, 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 listen. You gotta give me the time. I did a test run on this thing. It took me 20 minutes. I thought it could maybe push to 18, but you gotta give me at least 15 minutes. Give me the 15 minutes. No promises. Anybody want a, a soda or something? Because uh, I'm, uh, I'm going up the machine. I thought maybe, you know, I, I'd get somebody something. Because I've had all these sweets, and I think I'm gonna get something salty. I thought maybe somebody would. Uh, Oh, uh, I uh, finished debugging the phones. Uh, 
I, you know, I was going to debug, so I did. I, I, you know, told me that, so I, I debugged the phones. And uh, I thought maybe, uh, I should tell you that the uh, system is going to be uh, compiling for uh, 18 to 20 minutes. So some of the minor systems, they might go on and off for a while, but it's nothing to worry about. It's just a simple thing. Security systems are shutting down. Well, Nedry said a few systems would go offline, didn't he? Access main program. Access main security. Access main program grid. Uh, uh, uh. You didn't say the magic word. Please! Uh, uh, uh. God uh, uh, uh. damn it! Hate this hacker crap. Uh, uh, uh. Call Nedra's people. Uh, uh, uh. In Cambridge. Are out too. We will never find the command that Nedry used. He's covered his tracks far too well. And I think it's obvious now that he's not coming back. So, shutting down the entire system. You can get somebody else because I won't do it. I shutting will not. down the system is the only way to wipe out everything that he did. So there's something called an intervening cause. In a negligence case like this, an intervening cause is an independent act or an event that comes in between the initial event and the end result so that the independent event comes in and disrupts the natural course of events that would otherwise link the harmful conduct to the harm. If that independent act or event is big enough or strong enough, it can actually relieve that initial wrongdoer of any liability. That's when the intervening cause becomes a superseding cause. But in order for the intervening cause to become a superseding cause, the event has to be Big enough it really has to make a really big difference so for example let's say you have a truck driver crashes into a facility then that crash results with an explosion and that explosion creates debris that then harms other people in the area those people then sue the truck driver or the truck driver's employer more specifically if that explosion comes from explosive materials that are on the truck that the truck driver was driving then that might be attributable to the truck driver and then to his employer however if that explosion is a result of explosive materials that are at the facility and the truck driver just happened to hit that facility, in that kind of a case, the explosion is likely to be considered a superseding cause because the truck driver arguably doesn't know that there's any explosives in the facility and an explosion is just not really a foreseeable result from a typical automobile accident. In this case, the defense could argue that Mr. Nidri is a superseding cause because he was an independent actor that acted by his own volition to steal trade secrets and go on this excursion to sell them to Biosyn, and that in the process of doing that, he shut down the systems for all of the security and all the communications on the island, and that that resulted in the harms to all of the visitors. A trade secret is one of the four different types of intellectual property, the other ones being copyrights, trademarks, and patents. A trade secret is information that can consist of a formula, a process, a technique, or a device that a business can use in order to make the business competitive. To meet the most common definition of a trade secret, it has to be, like I said, used in business, and it has to give that business an economic advantage over its competitors who don't have access to that information. In this case, the embryos are definitely trade secrets because, as Mr. Nidri says, by helping to steal them and give them to Biosyn, he's helping Biosyn kind of catch up on 10 years of research. But to explain a counterpoint to that, I'm going to take off the defense attorney hat and put the plaintiff's hat back on again. 
The plaintiff's side can still argue that Mr. Nidri is not a superseding cause because he's an employee of InGen, the Hammond Foundation, and Dr. Hammond. In many states, an employer can be held responsible for an employee's conduct if the employee is acting within the scope of his or her responsibilities. That's a version of vicarious liability called respondeat superior. For the employer to be held liable, the employee needs to be either performing work duties or otherwise acting on the behalf of the employer. This is the case even if the employee takes a slight detour. A detour is a small deviation that an employee takes, but that's still somehow related to the employer's original instructions. And in many states, the scope of employment extends to employee misconduct that can be reasonably foreseen by the employer. In this case, Mr. Nadri is a computer programmer. Although it's not part of his job responsibilities, obviously, to steal trade secrets from InGen and to sell them to Biosyn, it is within his responsibilities to maintain the computer systems that oversee the security and the communication system at Jurassic Park. But it wasn't the theft of the trade secrets that caused the harm to the visitors. What did cause the harm to the visitors was the dinosaurs getting unleashed, and they got unleashed because Mr. Nidri screwed up the whole computer system that oversaw the security and the communication system. And the plaintiff side can argue that when you have a centralized security and communication system that can be impacted by one single employee, it is reasonably foreseeable that that one employee can exploit that system for his or her own benefit or to harm other people in the island. And it's reasonably foreseeable that doing so can endanger the lives of everyone in the entire island. So obviously, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, one of the main themes of the film is that man shouldn't be trying to mess around with nature and especially with dangerous animals that have been extinct since forever. And obviously we learned that so well that we've managed to do that another four or five times since then. But looking at it from a lawyer's perspective, we can also see that there is a liability aspect to this film. And tying everything together, we can probably conclude that the plaintiffs would very likely win in a lawsuit against the defendants on a claim of either strict liability or on a claim of negligence. The plaintiffs would probably win in a strict liability case because this is the kind of situation that would fit into a strict liability situation. The animals are reasonably known to be very dangerous and those animals actually caused harm to the plaintiffs. And the plaintiffs would likely win in a negligence claim because they can probably meet all four of those elements of negligence. First, the plaintiffs would be able to show that the defendants had a duty to keep the visitors of the park safe, especially since they were the ones that actually brought those visitors to the park to come and see those very dangerous animals. Second, the plaintiffs could probably show that the defendants breached that duty in several ways. You have the faulty security systems, you have the weak barriers between the humans and the animals, and you have the training issue with the visitors, that they didn't really give them much of any kind of education on what to do in any sort of an emergency situation with these animals. And third, the harms to the plaintiffs are pretty obvious. And finally, with the causation element, it's pretty clear that even though the defendants said that they had spared no expense. Spared no expense. Absolutely spectacular design. Spared no expense. Spared no expense. If they had actually spent a little bit more on some security systems and other security features, it's pretty clear that this sort of situation probably wouldn't have happened. And the way that Mr. Nidri fits in is that rather than being a superseding cause that disrupts the causation element by being some sort of independent force that the defendants couldn't have foreseen, instead, because he's an employee of the defendants and because he was acting within the scope of his uh, responsibilities as his job while he was performing his acts that led to these dangers and these harms, all of his acts can actually be attributed to his employers, who are the defendants. What that means is that Mr. Nidri's acts, which caused the harms to the plaintiffs, can actually be seen as the defendants causing those harms. And if this case were to be in the real world, it probably would actually settle fairly quickly with payouts in favor of the plaintiffs. So what do you guys think? Do you agree with our analysis? Was there any sort of information that we missed? Is there any other argument that you can come up with that would come to a different conclusion? Let us know in the comments. If you think that this video is worthy of a Jeff Goldblum award, I give it 10 Goldblums out of a possible 10 Goldblums. Go ahead and hit the like button. And if you're new to our channel and you want to see more, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. 
That way you can find out when the next video is coming. Thanks.